from coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world from the heart of Europe. To the tip of Africa. From the centers of Asia. To Central and South America. Your part of the world plunges prayer and praise gathering. Joining us from Trinity Music City in Nashville, Tennessee, are founder of Fixed Point Foundation, Larry Dunton, world-renowned eye surgeon, Dr. Ming Wang, Duke University and MIT graduate, Dr. Brian Miller, Grammy-nominated recording artist, The Newsboys, Freddie the Baker Calls, Prayer Partners around America. extend a very special welcome to all of you watching around the world. You know, the book of Romans says that men knew God and women knew God, but they didn't honor Him as God or give thanks. And it says their hearts became darkened. And when we stop giving thanks to God, then it says our, our speculations become futile. And so what we want to do is we begin to thank Him and praise Him. That's why this show is called Praise the Lord. But as we praise God and as we begin to turn our eyes to Him, then all of the problems that seem so large to us Whatever you're facing, many of you facing many, many crises, mountains, so to speak, that you think, I don't know how this is, how this is going to change and how my life can change. You've, you've come to the right spot tonight. This is going to be a very special show, a very special praise the Lord. We have not only the newsboys who are behind me, uh, uh, just an amazing group, internationally known group uh, that's on tour now, launching tonight their album, their brand new album, a debut performance tonight, God's Not Dead. Can we give it up for the newsboys? Absolutely. And that's good news. The good news is that God's not dead. God's not dead. He's alive. And we have, we have a, great, a, a great team of, of people that we'll interview. We have a physicist, Dr. Brian Miller from Duke University. We're going to talk about physics. So if science is your area, then this is going to be of, of, of very much of interest to you. We also have Dr. Ming Wang who has a, his, his medical degree from Harvard and a Ph.D. from MIT. He's going to be talking about some, some very interesting things, talking about the, 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 the bringing together of science and reason, that they're not enemies. And then uh, our first guest tonight will be Larry Taunton, who's the director of the Fixed Point Foundation. And Larry brings together uh, some of the great minds. He brings together uh, intellectuals and atheists like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins to debate against Christians, including himself. So this is going to be a night to build your faith. So we're going to start this night out very specially like we do on all shows. And we're going to go to God and thank Him and praise and pray to Him and ask Him to help those of you watching that you could be encouraged, that your life could be touched. This would be a life-altering moment. So let's just pray right now. Lord, Lord in heaven, we thank you that again, we do thank you that you're the God that is the bestower of blessings. That all that we see around us, from the creation itself, you said that the very creation itself speaks is ample evidence of your reality. And so, Lord, that men don't have an excuse to hide from you. Lord, we have to close our eyes to not see your glory as we see creation. But, Lord, beyond that, you, you did something even beyond creating a world. You became a man and walked among us. You lived our life, the life we should have lived, perfectly obeying the moral law. And you died the death on the cross that we should have died in our place. And three days later, you were raised from the dead. 
And because of your resurrection, Lord, it verified who you are. You are indeed the Son of God. And Lord, confidence can come to anyone listening that they're not just putting blind faith in a God they hope is there. But Lord, you're a very present God, a very real God, and you're ready to show yourself strong to everyone in need. Lord, may this program be not just special, may it be life-altering. May nations be touched by what they hear tonight. Moms and dads, students, educators, businessmen and businesswomen, politicians and leaders, may this be a very special show. We trust you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. But my next guest, uh, I can't really introduce you. I have to explain to you. You're, this is, this, I'm going to read this. I know Ming very well. But let me read this because I think this is important. Uh, Dr. Ming Wang was born in China and came to the United States in 1982 with $50 in his pocket and a Chinese-English dictionary. He is an internationally known corneal specialist who graduated from Harvard Medical School and MIT and is one of the few LASIK surgeons in the world with a doctorate degree in laser physics. As the founder of the Wang Institute, Wang Vision Institute, he has been a pioneer in eye reconstructive surgeries and has performed the world's first laser artificial corneal implantation. Am amazing, the world's first laser artificial cornea implantation. He has performed over 3,000 procedures on fellow physicians. That's not just the average person. The doctors are letting you operate on them. He is an accomplished author, an award-winning ballroom dancer, and a gifted musician. Would you welcome my friend, the Renaissance man, Dr. Ming Wang. Now, Dr. Wang, um, this is your third time to be on the show with us. Uh, every time you come on, uh, you get emails. You said one time you had emails from over 50 countries. In fact, when we showed a, a, a surgery you had done, where someone was blind and it was reversed, maybe set that up. But when you showed that, I'll set it up and you can explain it. A person in Morocco was watching this show, flew to Nashville within like a week, mm -hmm. and you were able to save their sight. Tell about that. Tell about what you showed in the clip, what the person would have seen in terms of the, uh, the reversal of the blindness. In that TBN show, in which you conduct an interview of me, we showed the video of a gentleman who lost sight for 13 years with chemical injury, 15 failed surgeries, and uh, by grace of God, he was brought back to his side and he saw his wife for the very first time. And uh, that was that clip. And uh, then um, I got an email just next day from Morocco. As you explained, we got email from Worldwide. This is a Worldwide show. And um, a young lady who was losing sight rapidly and in the course of several weeks she was about to lose all of her sight, about 99 percent gone. She just got enough sight left, was able to actually catch this show and saw it enough and pick up the phone and send an email and contact us. So we arranged our foundation, made the arrangement, so she was in Nashville within a week and uh, we were able to uh, diagnose a very rare eye condition that was not recognized before and by grace of God her sight was brought back and she flew back to Morocco. It was th this very show. Uh, amazing. Dr. Wang. <laughs> what, I, what I love about him, if I call him Ming, people will think I'm taking the privilege I shouldn't take Dr. Wang, but we, we, we're friends. Um, you do a thing in this city called the eyeball. Uh, quite, a, quite a play on words, but it is a, a, a fundraiser for, and you bring people from all over the world, uh, little children that could hopeless, I mean, uh, could never have afforded even the possibility of any kind of surgery, and you see blindness is uh, many mir miracle thing, mir miraculous things through the miracle of science and through the miracle of, of medicine. Talk about just some of those stories that, that uh, you've seen, some of those, like that man there that had his eyes reversed, any others? Yes. There was a little girl you had one year that... Yes. Had, had her had, uh, blindness reversed. It was a couple of years ago that we had. This young, um, we heard it, the story of a young girl of a five years old in India. She was uh, intentionally blinded by her own stepmother who poured acid into Kajal's eyes when she was sleeping in an attempt to make her into a blind child singer who would get more money from tourist passers-by. But after Kajal was intentionally blinded, such, they found out she could not sing, so she was abandoned 
in the train station called Qatar, India. So through our foundation, through a Christian shelter group we work with, we brought her to Nashville, and through many, many Nashvillians' help, and uh, we did one side restoration surgery, brought her back limited degree of her sight at the eyeball, 207, I believe. And uh, after, you know, the, uh, the dance show and everything, when the actual dance party started, it was Kajal who led the first dance. And when we I actually her, danced with her, that was right. so beautiful. And too. I gave her a microphone, I said, you say something to the 500 eyeball attendees, you know, big uncles, big auntie, who all love you more than your own family members. And Kajal took the microphone and surprised everyone, because she prepared in her own time, without telling any one of us, she learned how to sing. And when, she, when I gave her the microphone, she sang a song, she prepared herself, and the title of the song was, Jesus Loves Me. So Dr. Wang, here you are, uh, MD from Harvard, uh, graduate also from MIT, uh, but yet you have this faith in God, and many would look at you and say, someone with that kind of education, that kind of knowledge, that somehow the more you've learned, the more you don't need God, but it's just the opposite with you. Explain why that is. Yeah. I think sometimes as human beings, when we started out not having something, we are more appreciative when we do have something. And I started out not as a believer. I grew up in China, and 80, 90 percent of people in China today still are, do not have any religion or faith. And in fact, that is the very opportunity that we have this China Bible Project to bring Bible to China, translate to modern Chinese, and uh, to recognize the 95 percent are not Christians today of the 1.5 billion people. So a project that could potentially recruit for God's kingdom a quarter of human population. But I grew up in that environment uh, not believing in God. Then I came to this country to study science. So the more science I studied, the more unanswered questions I found. And then at one point I realized that science does not provide the answer that I was seeking for in life. Then through an inference of a professor at Harvard who, whom I respect greatly scientifically and he channeled guided me towards faith, towards Christianity. And then I found, I can find many of the answers I was seeking for in Christianity, in the Bible, in the words of Jesus Christ. So I think because I have come from, from a situation not having those, I appreciate more the strength, the power of faith, of Christianity. Bing, what I've noticed about you is that you know, when you say Christian faith, it usually means to most people, I believe Jesus Christ, I believe he died and rose again. But there's also an action part to faith that because he lives, then he empowers me to do things. And, and when I watch your life, there's just this overwhelming faith that no matter what the obstacle, no matter what the problem, that you're going to see through your hands and through science, God's still going to work through that. So. Uh, you don't see any separation between your faith in God and your practice of medicine. Talk about that, it's how a, they work together. It's a very, very important question today, especially with the rapid development of science and medicine, that we have more technologies now than ever before. We can treat more disease than ever before. And there's this notion that with the development of science, we actually need less and less of faith. And that there's this notion that the, somehow the development of science is in conflict of our faith and beliefs. And I believe the opposite. And I think that God wants us to pursue research, wants us to understand science, wants us to improve the quality of lives, but He wants us to do it in the right way, in His way, in the moral way, in the ethical way, and uh, a way that with conscience and with principles. And for example, um, uh, fetal wound healing research and stem cell research. Today, some people believe that we should not be doing this research, or some people believe that we should be doing research without moral guidances. And because it's a very difficult question, what do you do with a fetus? That do you uh, do research on the fetus to understand how to benefit adult, or you don't do research? And um, now, this I, is important. I want to slow down for a minute. Because stem cell research, obviously, in the coming election will be very much debated. 
because the, the, issue, the issue many times comes to this, that in order to get stem cells, you have to many times kill the fetus to harvest the stem cells. Mm -hmm. But what you talk about is that there's another way to get the stem cells yes. and still not destroy life. And so your, your morality of respecting life does not limit your ability to, to use science and the advances that stem cells can produce in helping others. There's a way to see, uh, to see both of them happen. So talk yes. about that. There's a way out. And um, sometimes it's not as obvious to us as mortal human beings. You know, we look at things, only realize why they are looking backwards. But God look at things ahead, why things should be, will be. And I, I think as a scientist, sometimes we do need to maintain our faith and believe that there is a solution that God doesn't want us to pursue research. An example of fetal research, what do you do? Do you do research on the fetus, on the stem cells to benefit adult, or do you don't do research and with, then you will not be able to have those powerful new medicine the stem cell, derived from stem cell to treat diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. So we actually were um, confronted with this problem at Harvard University many years ago. What do you do when adults injure with their eyes that we want to help them heal by understanding how the young little baby can heal but without, is it possible to do research without touching the baby? And uh, we stumbled upon this... Um, now, wait a minute, this is really important. Okay. What you found was that when when there was an injury within the womb, yes. it healed very fast. Yes. So talk about that. That's yeah. that was the that was the clue that a that in the in the embryo or in the, in, the, in the fetus could heal, the child within the womb could heal much faster. So there was something about the environment the child was in that that, that sped and, and almost gave miraculous recovery. That's right. We all know two year old. Uh, will come and down, break his or her legs, will heal in a few weeks, but 90-year-old, same injury, may never heal. So the younger one is, the better the healing ability. So the best healer is actually an unborn child. But here's the dilemma. Do you un try to research the fetal wound healing to benefit adult? But how can you do that research without touching the baby? We, stu we stumble upon this piece of tissue called amniotic membrane, which is a sac that surrounds an unborn child in mother's womb before birth. And uh, when the baby is born, the membrane collapsed, and the baby is delivered, and the placenta, the membrane, gets discarded, the amniotic membrane. So our thought process was maybe, maybe, just maybe that the, this membrane was connected to the baby before birth. It may have the same biological, youthful, wound healing property as the baby, him or herself. But the real beauty is, it's not a part of the baby. It was just like a blanket connect to the baby. So we started doing research, and actually we have a few slides we can Please show. show yeah. So this is a, a slide that shows the, actually the, um, the baby in the amniotic sac. So we thought maybe God does want us to pursue research to understand how the little baby healed, but without touching the part of the baby. So we started um, getting those amniotic sacs that donate by mother who donate uh, after giving birth to a baby, donate these membranes with the placenta. So we start um, harvesting those uh, amniotic sac after the baby was born. And let's have next slide. And uh, here's the picture that shows that we got this amniotic membrane, we process in a laboratory and put it on the filter paper. Next slide and then you put it into a bottle to preserve the youthful wound healing property of the amniotic membrane. We then, next slide, freezes in the freezer. And then when a patient is presented with injury, um, that otherwise with traditional therapy, they will blind because of scarring, because they are say 40, 50 years old, their healing ability was much limited compared with fetus. Then we take out these uh, membranes and then transplant the membrane onto adult injured eye. Then, miracle happened. Few weeks later, after transplanting the membrane onto adult eye, when we removed the membrane, we found instead of a blind, a scarred eye, we see, next slide, a clear vision, an eye can see. And our laboratory celebrated our scientific work. You know, we published the first paper in the literature demonstrating amnion membrane can actually reduce scarring. Because what happens, I think, the adult eye underneath the amniotic membrane is sort of fooled into thinking, oh, I guess we're not born yet, so we can start healing again. 
So it's a re recreate a fetal life. Amazing. But, but sci scientific, uh, scientific discovery is, uh, is wonderful, is um, very exciting. But to me personally, as I, I consider myself a, a little pupil in the pathway searching for the truth, walk with Jesus Christ, for me personally, that's a validation that God does want us to, research, to do research. And He wants us to understand how the little baby heals. He wants us, in this example, to use the amniotic membrane to understand the fetal wound healing without affecting the baby, but yet being able to benefit the adult. So as our laboratory was celebrating the wonderful scientific discovery, I felt that God was up there and looking down and said, See, I told you all. <laughs> In this People don't realize that science rose out of Christianity. This notion that somehow religion stifles scientific inquiry. No, it, 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 it spawned it. It, it, it. it inspired it because they believed that the world was rationally understandable. Then if we research, if we study, then there'll be an answer. I mean, if you see a group of kids out in the field and you say, what are you kids doing? And they, and they go, we're looking for Easter eggs. I mean, there's a presupposition that somebody put them there which inspires them to look. You don't really just see kids wandering around fields in July looking for Easter eggs. So it's the notion that there is an answer that, that drives us to get the answer. If we know there's a, it's like when you look at math problem, it may be difficult, but knowing there's a solution drives you to find that answer. Yeah, I mean, I think the most powerful example is the eye. Uh, one of the most powerful examples because the very complexity of the eyeball itself, how it captures the light and the, use rods and cones in our retina and interpret our images. And that's one of the most fascinating examples of God's creation. And we say research, research. And I look at research as research. Research and find out what's God's original creation. And I think in studying of science, I realize every day more and more what a wonderful, magical little, you know, the organ, the eye, God has designed. So for me, it's about understanding His creation, the magicness of it, and how to understand that to benefit uh, our patients. And that's the most satisfying aspect of being a scientist and a Christian. So when Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, one of the problems was the eye. Uh, it said it gave him a headache mm -hmm. because when you begin to, when you have to explain the evolution of everything you see arising by chance, random chance through natural selection, then you have to account for everything. You can't just have a few things you think might work. So when it comes to the eye and saying how could, how could you have evolution, when you talk about design, how could it just happen by chance? And when you see all the interconnections, when you, how many surgeries have you done? Eye surgeries combined, would you uh, guess? Uh, Fifty-five thousand. So, <laughs> 55,000, <laughs> 55,000 eye surgeries. So, and, <laughs> so in 55,000 eye surgeries, does it ever cease to amaze you the complexity of this amazing design of the eye? It never ceases to amaze me. You know, the universe is uh, supposed to have existed for about um, four to five billion years. And the universe is sort of in the middle age, so to speak. If you look at the complexity of the eye, just the organ of the eye, and look at the possibilities if it will evolve randomly, it will take much, much longer time than the entire lifetime of the universe. 13.5 billion is kind yeah. of the latest number out exactly. there. But, so but even now, if it was 13.7 billion years, yeah. it still would not be enough time. Exactly. So, I so complicated. So, I mean, there are more uh, photoreceptors and neuronal connections. And somebody calculate uh, neural synapses in one person's brain. And the amount of neuronal connection, the number of them, is equal to all the stars of the entire universe that we know today. How can such a complexity in the human brain evolve out of chance? It is, I think Christianity, the understanding of God's creation and there's a purpose of creation, is the most logical, is the most ra rational, is the most reasoned way of understanding life. And when people say there's no evidence, I mean, what, what we ask is this, is it, is, is it what, what is the more plausible explanation? 
So if you if you look at order, if you look at someone, if you find this book that our last guest wrote, and you see the the writing, and you see that it's intelligence, and you can read through it, and it makes sense. And uh, 244 pages, 250 pages. We know that intelligence produced this. If you look at the DNA strand within a human, that's like a third, a 3.5 billion letter book of the codes in our in our system that tells all of the things and tells us how we're to operate. I mean, that couldn't happen by chance. Mm -hmm. But yet, either either it happened by chance through the form of natural selection or there was a designer so as a scientist when somebody says everything can be explained by random chance by natural selection it couldn't be designed you say again what it's a pure mathematical improbability impossibility to completely have evolved by chance because the complexity of human genome you mentioned three billion base pairs GATC you know all these genes the combination of these four letters somebody said that if you take the human genome three billion base pairs and to put in the little library there will be like probably a whole library of books of all these GATCs and if it's completely evolved out of chance that means you grab one of the books there's a book of diabetes you look at as all the letters uh, ran, randomly jumbled with no meaning that's not the case in human genome all the sequence of base has certain meaning codes for proteins and genes to for various different human conditions so i think the most important is the very complexity of science is the most powerful example of the existence of god excellent Ming, and uh, when you look at your sci the scientific community around you, do you sense that this is becoming more of an awareness to your to your colleagues? How would you judge the the tone of those around you when they are confronted with that kind of complexity? Are you seeing them awaken to that, or are you seeing them finding a reason to reject that? I'm finding um, that they have more reasons to reject because of the increased complexity of scientific discoveries with computer automation mechanization uh, we find ourselves as human beings perhaps develop more and more of a notion that we are self-reliant we don't need God we can take care of ourselves we can dictate the world but just like as a doctor every day I treat patients we could have the most complex complicated machines EKGs chemistry different electrocardiograms but at the end is that connection to that patient is the emotional connection, is the ability to sense, to feel what patient is feeling and suffering and in order to be a truly good doctor. In this case, technology is actually creating more challenge for scientists and physicians to continue to be able to maintain faith with the development of science and technology. And I think what we need to recognize is that God gives us the opportunity to develop these technologies is to want us to help fellow human beings to improve the quality of lives and to deepen our faith not shallowing it but to understand that these are the magic wonders of his creation how can we understand it better and truly emotionally connect to our patient don't let the technology be a barrier but rather as a conduit to connect to our patients so I think the challenge for, for the scientific community to understand God to redevelop, re-strengthen faith, the challenge is more and uh, uh, more a daunting task than ever before. Ming, just in a couple of minutes we have left, uh, your homeland of China, uh, what a magnificent land, an ancient land. Uh, I like to tell people that I know God loves Chinese people, but uh, the Chinese because he made more of them than anybody <laughs> else. So, and yet, what do you see when you look back having come from China and looking back, uh, what is, the, what is the hope? What, what can turn them to God? What, this massive amount of people, and you being a, someone from China and having been turned to God, what can we do? Obviously, we can pray, but what, is, what can we do, and what, what do you think will tip, be the tipping point for the Chinese to, to experience God in a massive way as they need? In the last two or three decades, China has experienced significant, phenomenal economic growth. But just like as a human being, we not only need food for our stomach, we need food for our head, for our heart. Uh, with the 
collapse of communist ideology because communism has not demonstrated to be working. Communism only has made people poor. It is the capitalism in China that has improved the economy. So communist ideology has fell to the wayside. So people no longer believe in communism. But they are now seeking for new spiritual food. Because you cannot just have more material wealth, you have to also have more spiritual um, guidance. So right now, Chinese people are in a sort of spiritual vacuum. They no longer believe in communism, but they're seeking for new moral guidance. I think this is a historical opportunity. That's why, like our Chinese Bible project, bring the newly translated Bible into modern Chinese to people in China, to the 95% of the 1.5 billion people who are yet to hear the words of Jesus Christ. Mm. And I think such a project will have the opportunity to help recruit, as I said, for God's kingdom, quarter of human race. I think it's important that uh, Dr. Wang mentioned earlier that he came to this country not having faith and it was a professor at Harvard that reached out to him. You know, there's almost 800,000 international students in America alone. They come from all over the world to study, many times from nations that we consider closed, whereas they, they, you couldn't go there as a missionary, but yet they send their best and brightest, like Dr. Wang now, they, they send them to this country to study. And besides a, a college degree, they say in all the surveys you talk to these students, they say what we want more than anything else is an American friend. So if you're a believer today, one of the greatest things you can do is you pray for the nations of the world. And Jesus said, I want my house to be a house of prayer for the nations. You can begin to say, Lord, show me the college students, the international students. So many times just be, being able to have them over for a meal. Uh, you don't have to be a profound physicist or have some really overwhelming apologetic or Christian witness. You just have to show love. Uh, many times that friendliness, that kindness does more to break down the barriers and soften hearts. So just talk in the few seconds we have left about the importance of you being, being reached for Christ by someone here when you came as an international student. I think, um, yes, uh, I was influenced by this Harvard professor and into the path of seeking for Jesus Christ. And I think it's a, it's a responsibility for all scientists who are Christians to understand not only we need to maintain our own faith, but we have a unique opportunity to influence those other scientists and students who have yet to hear the words of Jesus Christ using our credentials, our what have we have done scientifically, our credibility to bring these young people, next generation, and of scientists into believers, and we have that dual responsibility. Fantastic. You know, I want to I just take a moment before we hear the newsboys again to pray for the nations. Uh, such a critical moment in history, 200 plus nations. Uh, the Bible speaks about the nations in turmoil. Just, you can feel the tension, and yet there's a God that created the nations, every one of them. Uh, he knows them by name. Each one has a specific destiny. Maybe you're from Nigeria tonight. Maybe you're from South Africa, the Philippines, wherever you may be from. God has a specific destiny for you. No matter who you are, no matter how poor, no matter how deprived, or, or you say, well, if I lived in a rich country like that, you know God's the God of, of the nations. When you turn to Him today, whatever your purpose is, He's not limited or bound to just what your economic outlook is or what your history is with your family. Whoever you are, when, when you turn to Him, and you have Him in your life, then, then all things are truly possible. So, Lord, I'm asking tonight, today, whenever this may be watched, Lord, for the nations of the world, that there would be spiritual awakenings uh, in many nations around this world. Lord, that, that you would encourage people listening in, in places where they feel like they have no hope. Or maybe they think, if I could just get to America or get to the West, something great could happen to me. But, Lord, right where they are, you can touch them if they turn to you and trust you. Thank you, Lord, for Dr. Wang and the, the witness that he brings to this country as a missionary from China to America. Lord, I thank you for the massive amounts of international students in this country. Lord, may your church become aware. May they become sensitized. And as, as, as you called us to be hospitable, which means to be a friend of the foreigner, the Lord, would we, we would befriend all of these great people from all these lands that have come to this land. The Lord, that we would see people touched and reached. And Lord, who knows that they might be the future world changer going back to their homeland to bring the gospel. We trust you for that in this season. We thank you for what you've done and the miracles we'll hear about from this broadcast in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you so much. Listen, again, wherever you're watching, wherever you're watching around the world, please call whatever number's on your screen. Email us. Let us know that you're watching. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Email him. He's a great man. He'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.